Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this sixth episode of the podcast, we will talk with Oliver Solbaum about the relevance of participatory processes in education, the benefits for the education of applying democratic and participatory studies. How participatory processes are applied to cultural heritage, the case of digital cultural heritage, and how to apply participatory techniques for the development of digital heritage education resources for working together with stakeholders. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. Participation is defined as the act of being involved in a process with others and engagement is defined as the capacity of keeping the interest of someone in something. Taking these definitions, the way of keeping the interest of someone is to be involved in this process. In the case of development of digital cultural heritage education resources in museums for young people, four stakeholders are involved. Educators, museum staff, young people, and creatives. To engage stakeholders, three keys are important. Firstly, to have a safe space. Secondly, to align motivations among stakeholders, like goals, values, and benefits. And finally, to build trust with the whole group. In the case of young people, Kersley and Schneiderman propose a model where they can have an active role in the process, be motivated for creating, problem-solving, reasoning, decision-making, and evaluating the project. For this reason, the work cycle for the development of digital cultural heritage education resources for young people with the stakeholders must be through participatory techniques in a transversal way and following the three steps for stakeholder engagement defined above, safe space, aligning motivations, and building trust. The work cycle should be composed of six steps, idea generation and validation, design, development, testing, redevelopment, and launch, and finally, impact evaluation. Through all this process, three steps flow continuously, research, participatory design, and impact evaluation. They are used to keep high innovation and quality standards. At this point, let me propose some questions. Which tools are the most useful to work collaboratively? How difficult is to build a safe space? Are there many people applying participatory processes in the digital heritage education sector? This week, I would like to talk with Oliver Sulbaum about it. Hello, all of you. Thank you very much for being here in this sixth episode. Hello. Nice to meet you. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Olivia Solvum is a creativity and democracy enabled, with more than 18 years of experience in project design and management, open innovation and co-creation methodologies for local, regional, national and international projects, working also as a European project director since 2013. His main role is to provide organizations with the tools, resources and game-changing frameworks, interpreting the needs of stakeholders and communities of practices with a close eye on the new societal challenges, opportunities and technological paradigm. Since 2001, he has been carrying out projects where the social users of ICTs and networking are applied to enhance communication, self-training, social entrepreneurship and citizen organization. In the international scene, Oliver has been presented at Innovation Congress and Digital Culture Festivals has been introduced in organizations such as Bas Mondragon Coop and several educational spaces around Europe, Asia and Latin America. Nowadays, Olivier is part of Platonic, an NGO of allied designers, researchers, makers and techies with experience in social change and civic engagement. Also, he works as a consultant and trainer in social democratic innovation an alternative economy for many public institutions, NGOs, social enterprises, and international citizen lab. Well, working as a facilitator for developing participatory processes and tools, could you tell us how important are the participatory processes in general for supporting the democratic values? So that's a, that's a huge question and a huge issue. Uh, but we, as, as part of uh, Flatonic, which is the organization I'm representing, we like to use the word wilder participation uh, because, uh, in fact, we, we, we are experts and we're learning every day uh, on designing, not only facilitating uh, creative methods, uh, so different tools and processes, 
uh, oriented to help uh, organizations and, and communities to find models for collaborative go governance. And usually with a strong focus on prioritizing those most adversely impacted within the project. So in doing so, we, we aim to enable like what we call wider, but also wider and more meaningful and radical participation for social change. And I think culture is a key issue to be brought on the table, uh, facilitate discussions, dialogues, uh, more institutional democratical processes uh, looking at finding solutions to complex issues. So I think culture is a huge vehicle uh, to find a, a terrain where all parts can have an understanding of what the issues is, even if there's a polarization in the, on, in the room. So basically that's, that's uh, where we stand. So we like to see participation as a way of uh, bridging uh, institutions and uh, citizens and both on, on a win-win kind of uh, uh, situation or relationship on the long term. So it's not, it's, it's about progressive engagement and a long term engagement. So we don't really like, uh, you know, very like, uh, uh, very institutionalized process or what we call like participation wash. So some, sometimes institutions just want like a participation just to validate something which is already pre designed. So we will be looking at uh, uh, designing with the affected communities. So that's basically where, where we work the most. It's really interesting what you say about how participatory processes are really important for culture, social justice, and understanding between institutions and citizens. In education, for example, the participatory processes are really new strategies. As part of Platonic, you are collaborating as a facilitator in some projects as P-Part. Taking your experience in the field, could you explain which are the benefits of applying these strategies in education? How they have been applied in your case? Okay, so usually there's a huge uh, need for uh, youth participation if we talk only uh, politics and not only education here, uh, since we have a certain age to, to vote. I mean, there's a whole uh, range of uh, ages, you know, from 12 to 18, where you're not actively asked or offered a, a, a clear way of participating. And I think that's, that's part of the uh, roles of our uh, NGO like ours. Uh, to guarantee that uh, we prepare youth for uh, real participation, uh, not only uh, participation inside the school, but also in their districts, in their families, in their uh, region and in their countries, right? So basically, uh, you've mentioned uh, BIPART, which is a project on, on bringing youth participation into rethinking schools as a space for, you know, uh, collect collective governance and uh, mutual education. But uh, we do consider that what we develop and deploy as part of this project is just about preparing a future generation in being almost experts or uh, at least people willing to participate actively politically. So I think that that's the, that's the most important uh, thing to look at. But after, if you look at specifically at the B part project, uh, it's of course about uh, how can we help teachers to become facilitators of their students and not merely uh, teachers. Uh, so the, the huge issue here is that uh, we plan to train the trainer program for the teachers uh, and there's no, we don't have a direct uh, eff effect on uh, what the students is receiving at the end. So uh, to improve such a project, we would like also to have a way of, uh, uh, you know, making sure that the, the training is affecting the students in a positive way. So uh, it's still on the way on the project because we haven't uh, evaluated the whole process. We, we are right in the middle of the, pro of the project, but I think it's a huge uh, uh, issue, mostly for teachers more than students themselves. I guess if you activate students on participating collectively on, you know, basically on uh, challenge resolution or solving problems in their districts or in their schools, they would be willing to participate. In it. So uh, I mean, the, 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 the the issue here is, uh, is about uh, changing the culture of the teacher inside the school. So that's, that's, the huge, uh, that's the huge issue. And we're working in different countries. So there's the you know, training. We have an issue of uh, languages here. So we're working in Spain, Greece, Portugal, and Latvia uh, for the collaboration of uh, four schools and four technical partners. So uh, basically, it's about training teachers and how to facilitate participation uh, so that to help them creating processes and also materials that can, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, educational materials that help them driving uh, a dialogue inside the, uh, as part of the school class. I agree with you. I think it's really important to give the opportunity to young people to make decisions in their educational community in a democratic way, although officially they can vote. They claim as students to have an active role in their educational community and saying what they think. 
So it was a further step to take these participatory processes into the classroom. The only issue is that teachers are not trained. Could you explain how you train teachers for applying these techniques in the classroom? Okay, so uh, mainly we have to make them understand uh, what the, let's say, co-creation or participatory mindset is uh, and how the, is this related with, uh, you know, centering diverse experiences in the planning of the processes, but also addressing power and power dynamics. I think that's huge because, uh, uh, you know, how to build capacity uh, you know, to leave important traces for future sustainability. I think that's 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 the issue. So it's not a, a one hit wonder, uh, you know, of participation, and that has another long term engagement for both students and and, and teachers. So uh, basically, we we have uh, uh, used the methodology since we all the co creation workshops and the training is happening online because of the pandemic. We have basically uh, de deployed. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous methodology at the same time. So basically we have these collective sessions where we train them, uh, but also we have uh, you know, reading moments, uh, exercises where you know, in between session, they are testing out some of the methodologies with the, with the students and they come back with, uh, and then we try to improve all, uh, all together uh, the original methodology. So it's a kind of a life cycle. Uh, and that's also an issue for for teachers who are used to, you know, use a series of uh, materials that are repeating themselves uh, uh, along along the different years. So, and there's an important uh, aspect here is what is the, ro the role of technology, social media, and uh, how can we apply innovative communication strategy to involve young people? So uh, that, that means in that case, we're using a digital platform to train the teachers. And then the outside, the outcomes of these uh, trainings are analogical. So that's that's a real issue here. So we have to double check if this uh, is really working. So because sometimes you, you know, methodologies that are uh, you know translated on, in an online space can work better, can work worse. Uh, so we have constantly to do this double check of uh, uh, you know jumping from the digital to the analogical world. But that's that's very interesting. Yeah, teachers who are trained in the way can apply in two other domains engaging students and young people with them as cultural heritage, for example. We also know multiple examples in cities where participatory processes have been applied successfully to cultural heritage, involving all stakeholders in the process. Taking your experience developing tools and applying strategies, could you explain to us which tools and strategies can be applied for digital cultural heritage? Okay, so we have we have the experience of bringing uh, culture assets or call it uh, heritage collections, call it uh, crowdsourced content uh, created by the different communities or different stakeholders of our participatory processes. Uh, so actually, we're working on uh, you know we have, we have this claim what we call uh, learn from history to co-create a better future, and we do believe. Uh, for example, I'll give you a, a concrete example. Uh, you know, so we had this participatory process in a school where we. Uh, talked about the migration phenomenon and polarization around this phenomenon and all the fake news uh, created around the migration. Uh, and, and so, so we basically made this simple exercise of having the kids reading the newspaper from 100 years ago and compare it to, uh, you know, a front cover of a magazine or a newspaper from uh, different, you know, political <laughs> origins and see that basically we're talking the same phenomenon is repeating. Uh, it's different population that are moving uh, across Europe, but I think you can learn from history on uh, you know pos you know possible uh, things that shouldn't be repeated. So uh, in that sense, you know jumping in time is very effective, very visual. Uh, so imagine as you know a series of uh, students reading the uh, news from uh, hundred years ago, and maybe you don't even mention it's from hundred years ago, and it seems that. It, same history is repeating. So how can we really use that to create a, a debate inside the schools? That, that works. So we do believe that uh, in, in, in culture mediated public dialogue and deliberation, uh, because on the other side, Platon is also working with local governments on implementing uh, participatory processes, which do have an influence, an incidence on, on uh, uh, po uh, public politics, uh, not exclusively on, on uh, you know, public participation regarding heritage. Uh, but also regarding like uh, you know social life, so uh, I, I do believe that you know, uh, you know this form of uh, new dialogues is the beginning of uh, you know new types of uh, uh, democracy where you jump from a dialogue which has uh, you know whole con contextualized by uh, 
uh, heritage, uh, a series of historical facts, uh, anthropological uh, insights, and then are all brought into the kind of a circular process uh, where we where we have like a, you know potentially beautiful results. So we can really consensually design a better future because we learn from the from the past. So that's an example. There's there's many of them. It's important to open cultural heritage to the whole community. I know from samples in World Heritage sites where participatory processes involve the whole community, how important it is to do it, as they can understand their past, as you say, building a better future. Yes, and I'd like to add, uh, our favorite claim now is uh, creativity and democracy, which is basically what, where we think we are most represented as an NGO, as many NGO like us working on, on the same issues. But I think it's, it's about reclaiming the bridging creativity, art, culture, and democracy uh, towards reconfiguring, the, let's say, participation and engagement. So uh, uh, from the challenges that we identified or identified by literature, so sort of including a non-European understanding, Connecting the transformative possibilities from what we, you know, we'd like to uh, define as dislocating democratic concepts and practices with artistic, creative, and social cultural perspectives, and this must go with data. Data can be cultural, digitalized cultural assets, but it needs to be also all these processes needs to pro, pro, you know provide or produce a certain uh, series of data. So we'd like to we like to see uh, also young people you've, uh, you know, designing their own surveys for the community, uh, being conscious about the, the uh, power and the empowering, uh, uh, you know, empowering aspect of uh, gathering your own data, which is not influenced by any Google search, for example. So I think it's so good that, uh, uh, you know, creating a survey can be a magical moment for, for, for use. To end this talk, can you give to the audience some tips and how some of these tools can be applied for the development of digital heritage education resources who engage communities and young people with all the stakeholders working together. Uh, yeah, so I can mention uh, uh, the Culture Labs project, which is a European project we are part of and we're also in charge of uh, designing a cooperation methodology. Uh, this is about vulnerable communities uh, being able to uh, you know, co-create projects around uh, museums collection and a new type of, uh, you know, uh, collaborative uh, curation uh, and uh, so we have also developed uh, a framework called safer spaces not safe spaces but safer spaces because no space is perfect <laughs> uh, and, and it's a framework which helps you know to apply to any uh, stakeholders a lens that takes in, into account that says structure, structural discrimination and seeks to find new ways to generate uh, rural communities and voices within the space. So we have a whole set of uh, indicators uh, which applies on uh, different phases of the life cycle of a participatory project, such as the design of the project itself, which should be should be a, a collective process with the community affected by the process or beneficiary of the process. Uh, of course, the moment where we have the process deployed and also its collaborative evaluation. So uh, we have defined that as it's part of a deliverable, so it's online. So uh, I think that that's, that's a great tool and we'd like also people to, to improve it because it's, a not, it's not a perfect tool yet. Uh, but but uh, I'd suggest that one and I'd suggest a couple of manuals we have been producing which are so important. And then we also lately have been working on, since uh, I've mentioned the pandemic, uh, uh, we, we were used to organize three days workshops, uh, maybe a two months uh, process in a school and that's not actually possible. So we have been translating every, all our methodologies online. So we have also created a manual, which uh, also uh, somehow is uh, written under the perspective of the facilitator, facilitator not really the participants. Uh, on uh, Because I think there's a, if, you, if you talk to facilitators uh, during the pandemic, it's even worse. There's, there's really a fear which ne we never evaluate. Uh, even these teachers of BIPAS, they might be uh, completely freaked out by the fact that they're, you know, deploying these methodologies. They're not the teacher anymore, so there's a risk they're playing somehow. So we did really uh, uh, create this manual on, uh, you know, how to resolve all the fears and better prepare the facilitators. Uh, may you be a teacher or a community leader uh, with participation's uh, secondary effects, which always happen. 
and happens even more when it's an online space to collaborate. So I think these are the three you know, two tools I, I would uh, suggest. So and they're all open source as everything we created is under Creative Commons licenses. Uh, just to let you know, we also produce our own software sometimes to facilitate. Uh, we do use, we collaborate a lot to an open source uh, project called Decidim, which is mainly a participatory platform for cities, which we uh, basically adapt to schools or any other types of uh, uh, informal organizations such as uh, you know, grassroots communities. So we do have uh, the, our own repository of all these methodologies, which is uh, Wattify with the O Wattify. Uh, dot org, I reckon. Uh, so hopefully you publish the link of it. So, uh, and then the tools that I was uh, mentioning, uh, most of them are, you know, uh, part of the uh, official European project deliverable. So they are on uh, their respective websites, so culturelabs.org. Uh, and, and, and make sure that uh, you get the, all the, the links to refer to what I'm just mentioning. So they, they're all open sources. But if you look specifically for methodologies, uh, this is on our Wattify platform. Those pages sound really great, with a lot of interesting tools. I think it's important to evaluate the impact from the beginning to know how your project is going. In this project, for example, I try to be the most transversal and collaborative possible, collecting feedback from anyone who is interested in it, the most important is to translate in a language the audience could understand what you are disseminating in an engaging and powerful way. Yeah, I do believe uh, there's a challenge for uh, cultural heritage institution uh, to kind of align a bit more their mission uh, to the mission of uh, social justice uh, NGOs, for example. So that's there's still a di dialogue to be opened. And sometimes you'll see uh, from, from my experience, I'm seeing so many museums or, uh, or collections, you know, being a bit uh, obsessed by perfection, both by perfection of, uh, you know, quality of the assets, they're digitalizing, that's fine, that's fair, uh, but also about numbers. So the whole collection should be there, but maybe, you know, we've done these exercises of bringing uh, uh, young people into museums and, uh, you know, organizing what we call a safari or a quest of the best 12 treasures of a museum collection. And sometimes 12, 12 items, 12 digital items, if they're very well curated, can produce more effects on you know, creating a dialogue between uh, different generations on the specific social issues than the whole collection. So sometimes it's also worth you know, uh, investing more into you know, co-creation methodology, gamification of a collection uh, and co-curation more than let's believe that if we put everything online and it's perfectly, uh, you know, classified, we have all these meta perfect metadata, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't guarantee any engagement. You need some kind of a magic effect there. So I've, uh, I think that's, that's always some, something to consider. It's not about volume, it's about quality. And, uh, and uh, you know, you, you need to you know, smell democracy in a collection, for example. Uh, so that, that's, uh, you can do that with 12 uh, treasures, 12 items, or with millions. So I'd recommend start with 12. That's true. Quality is better than quantity. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about how the participatory processes can be applied in many ways. Thank you very much and hope we, we have some more discussion and we, you, we get comments on the, on the, the podcast and we can start the dialogue with all the people listening to us. Do you like to learn more about how to overcome the barriers for getting an effective participation of young people in cultural heritage and museums, I recommend you a report edited by Arts Council on England, titled Hurdles to the Participation of Children, Families and Young People in Museums, a Literature Review, written by Sally Whitaker in 2016. To learn more how to work with local communities for developing more dynamic, relevant and essential cultural heritage institutions for them, I suggest you to read the book published by Museum 2.0 under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License, titled The Participatory Museum, written by Nina Simon in 2010. Look at this practical guide and discover tools and strategies to make participatory processes in your institutions. If you want to know European projects working on participatory research in museums for making them more accessible, I recommend you visit the Arcus project website. It aims to make art 
and its cultural experience accessible for all using technology and participatory research approach. It's composed by a consortium of six important museums, four tech companies and two universities of Europe and they have created a guide to make inclusive activities titled Towards a Participatory Museum, a how-to guide on inclusive activities, and a list of tips with ways of being inclusive in the museum through participation based on their own experience. Another powerful project is the Luchidare project. It aims to develop interactive learning opportunities to obtain knowledge as well as networking spaces to engage with a variety of stakeholders and heritage professionals. The researchers have created some resources based on their own way of working, as focus groups, workshops, or other types of sessions. Thank you very much for being today with Oliver Solbon and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be Find all the resources from the topics we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the DH Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. See you next week!